So hello everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Wilson. I am the Director of Communications at the New York Restoration Project um, and we are so thrilled to be hosting this webinar presentation today with Dr. Judith S. Weiss about understanding wetlands and climate change. Um, she's going to be speaking a lot about the actual ecology of wetlands but also you know concerns we have with sea level rise and specifically we're going to hone in on New York City. Um, I do want to give a little bit of a, a run a show and some details here. Um, please ask questions throughout her 45 minute presentation. Um, if you're new to Zoom or if you're used to it, um, you, you, could, you should probably see a Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar. And if you use that, I'll be monitoring the questions throughout and we're gonna save those till the end to not disrupt um, the presentation, but um, we'll be receiving those and please ask questions in that Q&A function as you have them. Um, we will also be having a, a response uh, to Dr. Weiss's presentation from Jason Smith, who is our director of Northern Manhattan Parks. And he works a lot at our Swindler, Swindler Cove location at Sherman Creek Park in Inwood. And there we are actually constructing a living shoreline that before COVID was gonna start construction next week, but um, is still gonna um, start in its own time. There's still some, some kinks to be worked out with these new, this new reality. But um, he will be talking about that specific location and how it relates to Dr. Weiss's presentation. Um, and we please feel free to ask questions during his part as well. Um, I don't wanna waste any time here though. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to everyone who's joined. We have about 68 participants, which is phenomenal. I think we were, we were all curious to see who would turn out for this. But um, I will let uh, Judy, I'll let you take it over here. And um, I will mute myself, but let me know if you need anything. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you're here. I would have preferred to see you in person, but this is the next best thing. And so uh, we're going to talk about tidal marshes or salt marshes and sea level rise. First of all, what is a tidal marsh or a salt marsh? It's a wetland that surrounds an estuary. And so you may ask, what's an estuary? Estuary is a place where fresh water and salt water mix. So it has a salinity less than, than the ocean. In a, a tidal wetland or salt marsh, you have a, a variety of different plants that grow and they have they undergo process called zonation which means that there are some at different areas. For example, uh, if you can see uh, the pointer here, the, uh, this at the right, at the edge of the water is the low marsh. And this is this part of the marsh is uh, underwater at high tide. And behind those plants, you have other plants that are the high marsh that is very seldom underwater. So the low marsh is flooded twice daily at high tide, and it's dominated by a plant called cordgrass or Spartina alterniflora. Here's a sort of a cross view of a typical salt marsh, looking at here's where the water line is. Here is your low marsh with the Spartina or cordgrass, and that's the low marsh. When we get up to zone three and four, it's the high marsh. And there's a bunch of different plants that grow there. They are seldom underwater, but they certainly are, water, are salt tolerant because there's the sediments, the soil they're growing in is very salty. So um, they are clearly salt marsh plants also. Uh, thinking about grass living in salty water, uh, it's a highly unusual grass that can live in salt water. Uh, plants dealing in salt water must be able to deal with the salt. And the plant, the Spartina, and it also must deal with uh, low oxygen. Uh, for their roots are growing in soil with very low oxygen. So the Spartina plants, which are the, uh, the cord grass, the ones in the low marsh that are underwater half the time, uh, take up the salt, but then excrete them uh, through the leaves. So if you look at the leaves, you may see little specks of white on them, which is uh, excreted salt. 
The cord grass also has special tissues that pump oxygen down to the roots so they can deal with the oxygen problem in the soil that they're growing in. Here's just a look at some other salt marsh plants. I'm not going into any details about them, uh, but these are ones in the higher part of the marsh. Uh, the functions of salt marshes are, are numerous. They play important roles for marine life. Uh, some fish, many fish breed in them. Other, other fish are living in them. Uh, shrimp, crabs, birds make use of the salt marsh. It's a stopping off place for migratory birds. It's a habitat for some mammals like raccoons and muskrats. Uh, one thing about a salt marsh is that it has very high productivity. There's a, a lot of plant growth every season and it supports a lot of life. In terms of its functions that are directly applicable to improving the life of human beings is their role in controlling floods and storm surges when there are storms, coastal storms. They also, for us human beings, and for the fish and invertebrates in the water, purify the water so that when there's rainstorm and runoff of water that may pick up various pollutants on its way running downstream, uh, if that water comes through the marsh, it will uh, get lots of the contaminants taken out of it. So by the time the water gets to the estuary, it's cleaner water going in. Um, another uh, important service that the marshes perform for people is coastal protection. Uh, there's a few pictures here of, you know, devastated areas after various hurricanes. Um, and when there are marshes there, they don't prevent, obviously they don't prevent any damage, but they do act as a buffer and uh, reduce the amount of damage. Uh, they do that by diminishing the wind penetration and the strength of waves and storm surge. And there was economic evaluation done in New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and the uh, areas, the more wetlands that a town had uh, between itself and the, and the water, uh, the more wetlands there were, uh, the less damage was done in terms of how much it cost, uh, how much economic damage was done. Looking at productivity, which I mentioned before, that it was very high, comparable to rainforests or managed farm. However, when you have all this plant material growing every year, uh, there are very few grazing animals that live on a marsh and chew up and eat the grasses while they're alive. What happens with most of this is that in the fall, the leaves die and fall onto the surface of the marsh, uh, the stems too often, and, and they then start decaying. Uh, and this process of decay or decomposition uh, turns the leaves and stems into what we call detritus. Uh, detritus or litter is basically the dead plant material plus the microbes that are doing the decay process. The detritus is then eaten by detritus feeders. There are a variety of worms, clams, crabs, and so forth that will eat this decaying plant material, the detritus. And those little animals then get eaten by bigger animals. So the detritus is in a way the basis of the food chain in the marshes. Uh, here's a few of the animals involved in processing the detritus, small invertebrates. We have uh, amphipod here on the left, isopod on the right, and there's a whole variety of worms that live in the mud that eat the detritus. So these little invertebrates break up the detritus into smaller particles and eat it, and, and the worms continue. And there are, are, are many other critters that work on, on, on the detritus. 
Some other important marsh animals that we should mention are uh, ribbed mussels, uh, shown here. Uh, these are very common in salt marshes. They are relatives of the edible blue mussel, but are not generally eaten. Uh, they have these threads that they put out called byssus threads that attach to sediments and roots of the plants and help keep the uh, sediments sort of bound together and reduce the amount of erosion in the marsh. The rib mussels also, or their waste products, uh, enable, uh, enhance the growth of the Spartina. So there's a, a double value of the rib mussels. There's also fiddler crabs are typical in salt marshes. Uh, of these pictures, the one up here is Yucca pugnax, and the ones down here is Yucca pugilator. These are ones in our local area. Some of these really red ones and bright blue ones are uh, live in other parts of the world. But fiddler crabs uh, dig burrows, and by digging burrows, uh, they can aerate the sediment, which is also good for the marsh plants. A few other kinds of animals that are found in salt marshes is a variety of snails shown here. There are shrimp, a couple of species of shrimp we find in salt marshes. Whenever there's something solid, barnacles will attach. A whole variety of crabs, beside the fiddler crabs, uh, are found in, in salt marshes, both hermit crabs and horseshoe crabs, which aren't really crabs, but they're there. We call them horseshoe crabs and, and a bunch of others that are typically found in salt marshes. A whole bunch of fishes, generally somewhat small fishes, have the killifish here or mummy shog, uh, silver sides, sheep's head minnow, stickleback, winter flounder, pipefish, typical marsh fishes. And then there are other large fishes that will be migrating through things like striped bass, bluefish, white perch, uh, migrate through. The um, mummy chogs and silver sides are often food for these larger fishes that will be coming through. Uh, there's one reptile that's typically associated with salt marshes, which is the diamondback terrapin. And there are huge numbers of different kinds of birds that we find in salt marshes. Uh, we've got gulls, ospreys, bitterns, skimmers, rails, oyster catchers, egrets, cormorants, terns, herons. The list could go on and on. Uh, I'm not going to go on, on and on with the birds, but there are many, and salt marshes are um, a major destination for bird or birding groups because of the numerous kinds of really wonderful, beautiful birds that live in salt marshes. Um, turning from a look at the uh, inhabitants of the salt marsh, uh, talk a little bit about marsh restoration. Uh, this has um, some relatively early uh, stages of development of, of restoration. There have been many efforts probably since the 80s. The main impetus for restoration was a policy of no net loss of wetlands, which meant that if you were going to pave over or destroy a marsh somewhere, uh, for development or, or for something, you've got to make another one, replace it with increase or a larger acreage of a new one. Um, and through the years of, since this process of restoration has been going on, it's become clear through scientific work that a new marsh might look like an old marsh within a few years, but it will not have all the functions or diversity of an old marsh for many years. That could take, you know, decades, 20, 30 years to regain 
the natural amount of diversity and functions. In a marsh restoration project, uh, one must think about what are your endpoints for success? Is are your main interest the vegetation or the species composition or the fish or the diversity or the productivity? You know, uh, people need to think through what their goals are and the endpoints. And in order to evaluate the success, you need long-term monitoring. Uh, too many restoration projects uh, are, are done by, by you know, contractors or whoever is doing it, and then they take a look at it after a year or two and then go away and, and they're done. But you really need uh, much longer-term monitoring uh, to, to really do a good evaluation of a restoration project. Uh, a couple of types of projects that can be done uh, is increasing tidal flow. Sometimes marshes get degraded because there's just not enough water coming in because there are roads, bridges, culverts that are blocking the water. And they may be just, in this case, a 12 inch pipe under a road was all there was bringing the water up into the marsh which is clearly inadequate. And so in the restoration, they replaced a, the original 12 inch pipe with four 24 inch pipes. So you're getting eight times as much water in there and a much better tidal exchange and the marsh becomes much healthier because uh, what makes a marsh healthy clearly is, is water. You need enough water. Another common practice in our part of the world is uh, restoring a marsh that is dominated by an invasive common reed, Phragmites, and uh, spraying herbicide, glyphosate, which you may have heard of as pretty nasty toxic chemical, uh, spraying these herbicides to kill the Phragmites, uh, and then they lower the marsh level and then replant Spartina. Uh, so this is a labor intensive process as you must imagine. And um, also if any underground rhizome fragments of the Phragmites are left behind, it will return pretty quickly. And in, in perhaps five or 10 years, uh, it will be all Phragmites again. Uh, and another issue is that frequently, until very recently, people doing this did not take sea level rise into consideration. And um, it, it currently, it's it, it, it's, I think it would, it, it's immoral <laughs> or certainly very foolish to do marsh restoration without considering sea level rise at this stage of uh, where we are, which gets us into the topic of sea level rise. And we see uh, clearly here at the Battery. No, this is at Sandy Hook, New Jersey. Uh, looks pretty much the same at the Battery. Uh, sea level is rising steadily. It's accelerating. And the major reasons for the sea level rise are because the water in the oceans is getting warmer. And when things are warmer, it expands plus the fact that glaciers on land are melting and the water that had been frozen on land now is in the water and adding more water to the volume of the ocean. Uh, the rate of sea level rise is, is accelerating and it is not identical all over the world, but in uh, our local area, it's pretty high. It's almost five millimeters per year in New Jersey. And I assume uh, it would be comparable in New York City. So this may not sound like a high amount, but it is a, it's, it's worrisome and we'll see why. Uh, so when we get to a, think about a salt marsh, we know a salt marsh is an intertidal um, ecosystem and in order to persist in the face of sea level rise it has two options it can either increase its elevation or move inland and if it doesn't do either of them it will just end up submerged and dead and open water 
or a mud flat rather than a marsh. And the process that happens is that as the uh, sea level rises and the marsh, if it's not rising at an equivalent rate, the water will not go all off the marsh at low tide. So it will form pools on the marshes. And so some of those grasses that are now underwater full time, have they, they've been adapted to being underwater part of the time, but not being submerged full time. And so the plants will die and you're leaving, leaving patches of bare ground that grow over time. Uh, it, so imagine the pools and just the pools are getting larger and larger and larger. And um, also threatened by this are uh, salt marsh sparrow birds, which nests in the Spartina grass. And uh, you know they are not going to survive if the nests are submerged. Uh, so the process here of, of what's going on, we have a situation which is mostly marsh with some water becoming mostly water with some marsh becoming open water and the marsh is all gone. Uh, the kinds of characteristics you need for your marsh to survive, uh, if they're located at the high end of their tolerance to flooding, uh, they'll be initially protected. Whereas if they're located on the low end of their tolerance to flooding, they're going to be um, in trouble very much sooner. Um, is the marsh rising fast enough to keep pace with sea level rise? Is the rate of sea level rise low enough that the marsh can keep up? You've got to have uh, both factors operating. If you have very high local sea level rise, uh, your marsh is at greater risk. Is there enough sediment coming in to build up a marsh? And this is varies on different estuaries, different rivers, different systems. Uh, some are giving enough new sediments, some are not. Uh, the tidal range is also a factor. Does the tidal range allow the plants to occupy a wide range of elevations? So they are buffered against the sea level rise. Uh, when these critical characteristics are not there, the marsh will need to migrate to high ground. And um, the ability to migrate inland uh, depends on there being open space available for them to move into. Um, so here again, can they keep up with sea level rise by elevating or migrating inland if there is open space inland for them? Many of the marshes in the Mid-Atlantic and New England areas are not getting enough sediments to survive. So, I mean, here's, here's our choices. Either accumulate enough sediment and dead plant material so you rise fast enough, and many are not. We can look at the plant Phragmites, the invasive common reed, which is often removed. Um, it does some important good things with relation to sea level rise. It increases the marsh elevation faster. It's producing more detritus on the marsh surface, which is then trapping more sediments. And the presence of this plant may very much, very well allow a marsh to keep up with sea level rise. Uh, there's a little picture of it for those who may not know what it looks like. Uh, another issue with the migrating inland in a highly developed area like New York and Northern New Jersey, migrating inland is not so easy because you've got roads, houses, development right in the way. Uh, there's a term called coastal squeeze to describe the situation of a marsh facing rising water on one end and a hard place it's not a rock in a hard place, it's rising water in a hard place on the other end, and the marsh could get squeezed out of existence, basically. So in urban areas, is there some way to provide what they call migration pathways? Enable the marshes to go in by getting rid of 
property that might be in the way. Can a government, a town, buy uh, private property or have conservation easements? Could they remove paved surfaces and make areas, develop areas, open up once more to allow the salt marsh to migrate? That's the goal of looking for possible migration pathways. Uh, here's an example. You've got a marsh on the left side of the picture and a road right behind it. And if the road stays there, that marsh, as sea level rises, that marsh has no place to go and will disappear. Can they get rid of the road or elevate it or do something? Looking a little bit more at Phragmites, the invasive form is a new genetic type that's been invading for many decades in East Coast marshes. And it's, uh, as we said before, often removed in restoration projects uh, with the assumption that it is ecologically harmful. In some ways, it certainly is. It displaces natural spe the native species in the high marsh and can displace Spartina alterniflora in lower salinity areas in the low marsh. So yes, it does do harm. But in terms of other effects on, on animals, uh, it's, it's a spotty record. Uh, there are studies that show in the tidal creeks pretty much equivalent fish populations. Or is there other studies that find reduced fish, especially the killifish or mummichog, which is a, a really important, dominant uh, marsh fish. Uh, this fish does not like Phragmites marsh. Uh, and, and, and a meta-analysis, meta-analysis is sort of surveying all the literature that's been done uh, in a quantitative way. And so this meta-analysis found a somewhat negative effect of Phragmites on the populations of fish in tidal creeks. But it was very variable from one place to another and depending on which fish you looked at and which life stage of the fish. But it, the, the, the basic thing is somewhat. It's not disaster for fish. Uh, most studies find equivalent invertebrates or benthos on the marsh surface and in the mud in both types of marshes. In terms of terrestrial animals, clearly more birds prefer Spartina to Phragmites. In Phragmites, habitat is better for bird species where the whether it's Phragmites mixed with other things or fragmented or with pools as opposed to a solid uh, monoculture of Phragmites. Okay, so I mean, back to the habitat value, I think we can conclude that Phragmites is somewhat less good than Spartina, but it's certainly not a disaster. It, it is supporting a lot of, a lot of life. In terms of other ecosystem services that the plant produces, it is better at sequestering nitrogen. Uh, its annual rates are much greater than, than Spartina. The Phragmites marshes remove lots of nitrogen from the surface waters and from the soil. And even the microbial biofilm that forms on dying and dead stems will perform uh, important denitrification, that is the denitrification is turning the nitrate into um, elemental nitrogen that goes back to the atmosphere. So uh, all in all, Phragmites is doing good stuff. It's taking out lots of nitrogen that is not available to stimulate algal blooms, which can lead to uh, low oxygen and very poor water quality. Phragmites also is better at sequestering carbon dioxide than Spartina. And of course, carbon dioxide is the main uh, contributor to global climate change. And, and here you see the plants in and near the water are referred to as blue carbon. Uh, uh, they are taking in much more carbon dioxide 
than they are releasing. And this carbon is ending up sequestered into the sediment, into the soil. And this is carbon uh, that's not going to be contributing to climate change. In one of these studies, they evaluated a restored wetland in which Phragmites had been removed and replaced with Spartina, and they found that was releasing a lot more carbon dioxide than the Phragmites marsh would, would have. So the restoration ended up causing greater emissions of carbon dioxide. Uh, another important ecosystem service of this plant is that it enables a marsh to elevate more rapidly and keep up with sea level rise more effectively. Um, it builds more sediment, it builds the soil, it produces more litter that traps more sediment. Um, the marshes in our part of the country, in our part of the world, have extremely rapid sea level rise and most of our marshes are not keeping up. Uh, marsh migration inland would be the answer, would be an answer, but it's again not very feasible in many parts of the New York, New Jersey Harbor area. We're very developed. Uh, there's very little open land immediately landward of our marshes. Um, Dense, tall plants like Phragmites are a better buffer against storm surge and winds. There's a group, a community group in Piermont, which is up the Hudson River, that when uh, they were offered uh, that the state DEC would, would remove their Phragmites and restore the marsh in front of their, their homes, they said, no, thank you. We want our Phragmites here. Uh, they were convinced that the Phragmites had protected their neighborhood against the damage of, of Sandy, much more than other neighborhoods that ha didn't have the Phragmites in front of them. So uh, that's the Piermont Marsh Association. Uh, so now we look, what can we do about it? If we can't move the marsh inland very well and it's not keeping up, vertically, what can be done? Well, there's ways of adding additional sediments. Uh, one of these ways is called thin layer deposition, where they take uh, sediment and spray it onto the marsh surface, which then buries the existing plants. And in a year or two, um, some of the plants will then grow through and restore the, the marsh grass. Uh, some Sometimes they will plant uh, plants on top of it. It may take several years for a marsh to recover, and it's clearly you know, not pretty during the time that it looks like a, a bunch of mud. Uh, issues uh, with regard to this is how thick to make it and how soon before you have to do it again. There's no clear answer. This is a pretty experimental process and may have different answers in different regions, different marshes, how, um, you know, it it's, hasn't been done that often and hasn't been done from, for that long that we are still not knowing, you know, the answer to those questions. Uh, there was a, a study, not a study, a project done by the Army Corps of Engineers in Jamaica Bay. Uh, the map here is showing in green what the size of the Jamaica Bay Islands was in 2003, and the red on the outside is what the size had been back in 1974. So you see among these marshes, there's, there's some, either some loss or this one, an enormous amount of loss, uh, in the time between, uh, in, in those decades. And what a lot of the marshes looked like at that point were these little individual hummocks with a lot of water in between that would have then disappeared completely if they hadn't done something. And so what they did, being the Army Corps, they do dredging, and they had a uh, harbor deepening project that provided them with a lot of sand and they took the sand and put the sand around the outside of these marsh islands to enlarge them. 
back to the 1974 size. So they have this, these machines and they're pumping in the sand and enlarging the islands. And then they involve community groups coming out to plant Spartina in this new area. They did not um, make these things very high. It's, uh, they didn't have an infinite amount of sand and they wanted to uh, maximize acreage of low marsh in the project. When they first, after they did it, they noticed that there was a lot of subsidence and they had to add more dredge material to get the elevation that they wanted. But uh, I was in, uh, involved in one of these restoration. It was fun being out there planning Spartina. Um, another approach that is not, the, has not, it's also experimental, has been done successfully in Holland. And what, instead of putting the sediment on top of the existing area, they put the mud, they, they dredge the mud here, and then they put the mud as a big pile in the channel and let natural processes, let the currents disperse the sediment onto the nearby salt marshes. So uh, this is something that is ex also experimental and uh, holds some promise. Another thing, Louisiana is, is on the forefront of a lot of work on restoring marshes because they are losing marshes faster than anywhere else in this country. Uh, would be recycling Christmas trees. Here's this big resource of, of plant material um, becoming available every January. And they have a long-term project of putting these trees out into wooden cribs and setting them to rebuild the marshes. And the trees are also protecting the shorelines from pounding waves and so forth. And this, has, uh, this is involving a lot of the uh, coastal parishes in Louisiana in attempts to save, save their marshes. Another thing being tried in Louisiana would be a floating marshes, build, build some structure out of wood or PVC pipe and plant, you know, get dirt in it and plant plants in it. And it floats on the water and it goes up and down with the tides. And, uh, you know, sea level rise is not going to disturb a floating marsh. Again, this has, of course, very limited size compared to a vast natural marsh. But uh, it is a pr procedure that's being worked on also in Louisiana. Another problem that marshes are having is erosion at the edge. See here in this slide, you've got this. What happens is it's eroding at the edge and then chunks of marsh are going to fall off. So your marsh is going to be receding and getting smaller and smaller from its edge because there's not enough sediment. The edge is moving inland over time. And here you see it in this diagram, you have the bank getting undercut and then this piece of marsh is gonna fall off. And so what they, a, a, process, a thing called the living shoreline, uh, sometimes putting rocks or even better to use oysters and so forth at this edge is protecting the marsh edge from getting battered by waves that would be undercutting it. And um, this has turns out to be better storm protection than a marsh alone, and even better storm protection than a seawall. And of course, a seawall would have, um, if they built a seawall, that's the end of the marsh uh, completely. So there is promise with living shorelines as well. So, um, we have a few conclusions here. One, marshes are very important, both for marine biota and people. Marshes are at great risk from sea level rise because of climate change, uh, and their choices are either elevating fast enough or migrating inland. Um, some, what we might call natural solutions, leaving some Phragmites 
there, don't take it all away. And this uh, migration pathways issue require, will, will meet some opposition, will there will be some controversy, will require changes in policies, and will have to be done at the local level, a municipality uh, that dealing with the real estate, if you are going to try to make pathways and buy out uh, residences and so forth. Not easy. And then finally, there are the engineering solutions, adding sediments and replanting, living shorelines and so forth. Um, they're expensive and experimental. There's no set formula for how you do them. Uh, they appear to be, in many ways, site-specific in terms of, of exactly what you do, what's the best thing to do. And of course, you have to remember that they are also temporary. Uh, the sea level is going to continue to rise, and um, you're going to have to do it again sooner or later. So there is no easy solution to this. And I, I'm done. Well, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm going to start my video here again. Um, we've, we've had a good number of attendees. We've had about 93 people join in um, consistently. And I think that before we stop for a break, um, if you want to, Judy, would you like to go ahead and answer some questions now? We have eight here. I could do that. You want to do okay. four? for later whatever you want let's let's yeah. start and see how far we go and then and I'm Jason I think is unmuted too so if he can help answer any of these as well um, we'll do that um, the first one we have is from Evelyn and she asks what plants would you recommend to enhance and diversify a human-made salt marsh in addition to Spartina well if you have a high marsh there are a variety of species that are typical in high marsh, um, the Spartina patens, and then there, there's a bunch of others. I showed a slide with a bunch of them. Um, do you want me to go back to the slide? I don't know. Uh, this is, uh, well, so, there, there's, a, there's a variety of uh, high marsh plants, but it depends on your, you know, how, if you have only a low marsh, uh, Spartina alterniflora is going to be the only one. Unless, um, if your salinity is low, which we have in, in northern Manhattan, you, you have a lot more flexibility. So it, it really depends if you're in the New York estuary, where you are, um, how, how brackish your water is. And so um, what we might think of a, as a salt marsh, if you have low salinity, you, you can introduce a lot more um, types of plants like um, bulrushes and, and, and other um, plants. Yeah, and Judy actually, some say that again? Sorry. So you might get Phragmites there without even having to plant it. It may very well come. Yeah, so a, a later question here, someone was asking if you could share your slides and if you send them to me, can we send them out to the attendees of, of this webinar? That's fine. Okay, so we, if you've got those plans listed there, we will, we will email them out um, after this. Um, so the next question is, is Sheep's Head Bay named after the Sheep's Head Minnow? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, do you know? No idea. <laughs> No idea. Um, Good to well, hear from you, Janet. Yeah, Janet. Um, sorry we can't help you. There's a bigger fish called the sheep's head that may be um, a fish, maybe, a, you know, fished for, uh, whereas sheep's head minnow only is about an inch long. Uh, I doubt they would name it after a, a minnow, uh, but they might have named it after the sheep's head, which is a, a larger fish, but I really don't know. Yeah, so we, we're sorry we're not able to help with that one. Um, so our, our next question is, are you familiar with Aspartina borer moth? There are a few records of it in our area. Is it rare or threatened in our area or maybe just not well documented? Again, I don't know. Are you aware of it, Jason? No, I'm not familiar with it. Um, we haven't we don't have any any evidence of, of insects causing a problem for our spartina. 
Yeah, we're not sure about that one. Um, but Judy, if you have, if you think about these and you have answers later, I'd be happy to email them uh, to the group if it's something that you want to consider. I'll share the questions again after. Okay. Um, next up, we have a question that says, uh, does this pesticide, so I assume that they're um, referring to glyphosate, glyphosate um, does this pes pesticide spraying leave toxic chemicals in the area as well as perhaps not getting all the Phragmites? So does it leave toxic chemicals in the area in addition mm -hmm. to not? Mm -hmm. um, it may, I'm not sure. I would expect some of it would be uh, staying in the soil after, but I don't really know. I think that the chemical may break down. It's not the sort of persistent sort of chemical like DDT and those kinds of things. So it probably, breaks down, but while it's there, uh, it, it's not, uh, it, it's quite toxic to a variety of things. Anything you want to add, Jason? No, um, I, I think, um, I, I can't really speak to that question either, but um, except to say, I, I do think as an industry, horticulturalists and restoration practitioners are, um, we do rely too heavily on it. And I'm, I'm glad NYRP doesn't use any pesticides in our work. And I think there are a lot of alternative strategies, uh, particularly um, I, I'm happy to hear uh, Dr. Weiss suggest that we might want to learn to appreciate Phragmites. Yeah. Um, next question is, or it's more of a statement, um, please discuss ghost forests. We have a small woodland that is getting a few inches of seawater at super tides and it is dying back. What are good strategies for replacing vegetation or otherwise compensating for the lost trees? You may find a marsh developing there if the, uh, the soil is appropriate um, and if the slope is appropriate, I don't know if it would be worth your while to try planting Spartina or something there. I guess if you could get it and it wasn't too expensive, it might be worth a try. Anything to add, Jason? Um, no, but I, I mean, I, I do think that's one of those situations that really is site specific. You know, there may be situations where um, flood or salt tolerant trees would, would um, help for a certain site, depending on, on how persistent the, the flooding is. Got it. Um, okay, moving right along here. Um, and we may, we're getting some um, conversation in the questions I see, I may um, post those to the chat. I think um, some of our attendees are ans helping answer some of these questions. So I'll post some of the answers to those over in the chat um, after this. Um, but the, the next question here, how would, you, how would one get rid of a road and encourage marsh growth in that area? I think if you, you know, get some, shovels or jackhammers or whatever, the way they take out roads for, um, you know, I, I don't know the, all the tools that are used, but there's a bunch of things to break up the concrete or the pavement or the asphalt or whatever the road is. And if you can put down and repla replace it with appropriate um, soil, um, the marsh should just, and the slope is appropriate, the marsh would just go there on its own, if providing the, the slope is right and the soil is right. I just add to this, I think um, probably the technical process that, that uh, Judy touched on is easier than the political process um, <laughs> and the bureaucratic process uh, of um, thinking about how to, remove a road, but I think 
it's the kind of work we need to do. Um, it's such an urgent problem. And, and to me, it really touches on an important issue, which is if we um, can move away from our reliance on the automobile, we open up a lot of opportunity for ecological restoration, um, whether it's on the shoreline where it's most critical or on the uplands. And so I think central to, to sustainable cities is, is um, thinking about how to, how to drive less and how to, um, and, and then building some of the political work and energy that's gonna be needed to, to really make it happen because it's not gonna happen without a lot of engagement and a lot of political work. Mm -hmm. All right, next question here. Am I remembering incorrectly, um, but are Spartina invasive? It's fascinating to see the benefits provided by Phragmites to mitigate sea level rise. So are Spartina invasive? Spartina alternate flora is invasive and detested in California uh, and China. Um, but it's interesting, you know, it, it, China is, is a particularly interesting case because it's like going through the mirror uh, the papers coming out of China, uh, ho oh my God, we have this horrible invasive plant. It is replacing our beloved Phragmites, okay? So it's exact opposite of what's gone on here. And then here, there are some of us who are saying, hey, you know, this isn't necessarily an evil plant. It is doing some good and we need to think about it in, in, as not just an evil thing. And then now in China, they're seeing the Spartina is helping when their marshes are, are getting reduced horizontally, that Spartina is going out on the mudflat and creating new marsh on the mudflat. So it's, it's, you know, it's like a mirror image of what's gone on here. Yeah. Alrighty, next up, um, how much of the changes to, to level water at marshlands is natural versus climate change? How much of what in marshlands? I think the question is asking, out of what we're seeing with sea level rise, how much of that is naturally current, occurring, however you want to define that, I guess, versus climate change? I would say most of it is climate change. Jason, anything you want to add? Yeah, in? I mean, uh, again, I'm not totally sure about the question, but there's a big daily um, tidal change, which is natural. You know, at, at Spindler Cove and Inwood, the, the, the tides can go, the water level goes up and down about six feet a day. But, um, you know, over the last hundred years, I, I, my understanding is it's almost entirely attributed to human um, driven climate change and, and thermal expansion of the water. And, 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 you know, Dr. White didn't touch on what we're looking at, but it's, it's, it's quite dramatic and unpredictable forecast for the next hundred years. So, so, and again, I think it's, it's almost entirely attributed to, to the human role in climate change. Mm. All right, um, next up, this isn't phrased as a question, but I'm gonna read it verbatim and then we can respond. It says, Docks, how they impact marsh degradation. Well, so I guess word? how they impact marsh degradation. How Is there the first word? Docks. Docks. Ah. I shouldn't think the presence of a dock would have a, I mean, we're talking about a little dock or are we talking about a massive pier? Uh, the major problem of this is shading. And so that the, if a dock is um, high enough and small enough and has spaces between the slats of wood, that enough uh, light can get through to the grasses underneath, it shouldn't be a big problem. Uh, you might have some other problems if you're um, wood used in the dock has had wood preservatives put into it. That gets into another whole field of research that we were involved with several decades ago. Uh, pressure treated wood, the green stuff, which will leach out 
chromate, chrom, chromium, copper, and arsenic, which would then drip onto the plants below, would kill it, but it would, plants would take them up. And so the animals that might eat detritus from those plants might get elevated levels of those metals. So there can be some problem. But the dock itself is the major issue is just um, a shading. All right, so we have one more question here. And then um, uh, Jason and, and Judy, do you, do you want to break after that before Jason gives his response? Or Jason, do you feel like you can launch right into it? Um, I, I think we should go right into it. Um, okay. While, while we have um, a good crowd. Um, and just follow right. up on some of the questions. Great. So um, as we go into Jason's part of the presentation after this question, um, please continue asking your questions here. Uh, like I said, for some of them, some of you who have responded to other questions, I'll put um, that information in the chat as Jason is presenting. Um, but yeah, let's. I'll go, go to the last question we have here. Are there any maps to show where new marshes might be formed in the next 30 years, barring human intervention, resulting from three plus feet of water rise? So basically, do we are there maps that exist that show where marshes might be, you know, in, in the coming decades? Oh, you're you're muted on yeah, Judy. If you go to your Zoom toolbar there, you should be able to click mute again. There we go. Okay. Um, I couldn't get the toolbar to come up. Say the question again. I was getting sure. trying to unmute. <laughs> We're all good. Um, are there any maps to show where new marshes? Yeah. There are some maps. Um, there was the two reports. One was by um, Betsy Blair, who was a consultant to the New, New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program. And she wrote a report about migration pathways. And there may have been some maps there. And also, uh, Isabel Stinnett, who uh, works for the Harbor Estuary Program, has worked on this and has gotten put put together a map for uh, I think northern New Jersey indicating certain places that seem to be uh, good spots for migration pathways in uh, Raritan Bay I believe. Are there any other maps you want to plug Jason? No no um, I, 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 I think I'll leave it with that. Yeah, and you're going to go over in your presentation how sea level rise and, and you know is projected to affect part a part of New York City. But um, with that said, um, just a reminder: please continue asking your questions. And um, Jason, I'll let you take over sharing your screen. Okay. Judy, if you want, you can you can mute yourself again just in case. Get the toolbar to come down. Oh, if you if you move your mouse, I'm doing that. Oh, now it came down. There we go. So, um, thanks so much, Judith, and thanks for everyone who logged in. I see a lot of friends and colleagues out there. Um, so I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, it's nice to spend a little time thinking about um, wetlands and the outdoors right now, I think. Um, I just wanted to, to follow up on some of the themes um, Judith raised um, and connect them to a project MRP is just about to realize in the Swindler Cove section of Sherman Creek Park in Inwood. So it's on the, um, I think everyone can see my cursor. It's on the, the shore, Manhattan shore of the Harlem River in Northern Manhattan. Um, MRP manages a, a, a park with the New York City um, Parks Department. And within that park, there is a small remnant wetland and a large um, wetland that was built as part of a restitution project 
which is something Dr. Weiss talked about. The it was built actually by the State Department of Transportation in, in compensation for a, a natural wetland that was disturbed somewhere else. Um, and about 10 years ago, those marshes started failing really rapidly. Some of the initial um, marsh restitution failed right away. And, and, and over the years, some of the natural remnant marshes that fringe the edge of the Harlem River started collapsing fairly quickly. Um, in this photograph, you can see there are these tiers of, of marsh receding from the rising waters. And when I started noticing that, actually it was pointed out to me by a wetland scientist, Bill Young, who, who was bringing a class of students through Swindler Cove. And, and he really alerted me to pay a little more attention to what was happening right in front of us. And um, since that time in about 2010, we've lost about 30 to 50 feet of, of marshland here. Um, and when I began talking to our colleagues and some of the scientists and regulators, there was a lot of uncertainty over what was happening and if we could do anything about it. And um, it's just very troubling. As you can see, this is a, a small little marsh, but it's incredibly lively and, and diverse and, and incredibly important to the community and the people who use the park. And it's trapped between the Harlem River Drive and the rising Harlem River. And so it's experiencing that squeeze that, that Judith talked about. Um, and it's a tiny bit uh, of a really complicated system that, that an extensive system of wetlands that used to run through Northern Manhattan. Um, if anyone's familiar with Northern Manhattan, this wetland here um, is, is what's now Dykeman Street. It used to be open water and wetlands. This is um, an old British headquarters map of, of Manhattan that um, Eric Sanderson at the Wildlife Conservation Society used for his Manhattan project. And you can see a lot of the historic wetlands that made up New York City um, in this map, and, and most of them are gone. And so even before sea level rise, we managed to do a, a great deal of damage to our wetlands and our shoreline, um, hardening most of it. And, and now sea level rise is really threatening what's left. So it's, a, it's really an incredibly urgent problem. You can see um, this is a historic photo from New York State Archives of, of the site. This is this is Sherman Creek Park, and this is the area where we'll be rebuilding wetlands. Um, this is from the 50s, and um, there's very little wetlands left. This was um, right after uh, 10th Avenue extension was built through Northern Manhattan, and this NYCHA property um, was the Dykeman Houses was built on top of what had been Sherman Creek, which had been open water and wetlands. And, and one of the reasons why I wanted to include this slide um, is because it, it, when we're thinking about the future and we're think, thinking about sea level rise, um, this property and this community is going to experience flooding right away. And so we're going to, we have a really complicated social and ecological problem um, that isn't affecting New Yorkers all the same. And so it, it's, um, we saw flooding in this area in Hurricane Sandy and we, um, what used to be Sherman Creek now runs through a sewer pipe under this housing project and it's not going to take long before those sewer pipes start to flood um, as we experience more sea level rise. Um, we know there were fringing wetlands all along the Harlem River and this is really what we're working to bring back are some of these small wetlands. Um, and Dr. Weiss talked about engineering solutions as one way to restore wetlands and, and um, she also talked about the challenge of making marshes that can um, keep up with sea level rise on their growth. And so um, we're really excited in, in this project. We're, we're building an intertidal oyster reef um, by hand with small blocks. And we were planning on engaging a lot of volunteers. At the moment, we may have to do it just with NYRP staff. But our, our plans are for this oyster reef to actually encourage uh, natural sedimentation um, and so we won't have to worry about spraying sediment on our wetlands. We're expecting that um, by building an oyster reef, which is a missing part of the ecosystem, um, we'll be kind of creating a continual sedimentation uh, of the wetlands. And so we think um, it, it's providing um, a really kind of broad spectrum ecological restoration and, and, and a really novel solution to the problem of how do you build a marsh that can keep up with sea level rise? And we've done some preliminary research and pilots that suggest that we'll, we'll see a lot of natural sedimentation 
So we expect to see our marshes start to regrow pretty quickly after we install this oyster reef. And we're really excited about it. And I, I think one of the reasons why I really um, want to share this as broadly as possible, and I'd love to hear what Dr. Weiss thinks about the project, is because it's um, this kind of project requires a lot of flexibility and a, a lot of changes to our normal way of doing things and our, our normal way of thinking about managing public space and natural systems, particularly in a city where, where um, everything is hard <laughs> and everything is expensive. But we found that um, we can manage a really thriving, beautiful wetland. Um, this is the section of wetlands in Swindler Cove that are protected from sea level rise and are doing fine. And it's a small little park in a really busy neighborhood, but it's incredibly diverse, incredibly beautiful. For those of you who haven't been here, you should come visit. And, and our goal is to expand this and, and really show that we can make a resilient wetland park in a really dense, really developed area. And um, we didn't talk about it too much, but um, these little wetlands are powerhouses of, of um, solutions for the climate problem in terms of sequestering carbon and, and mitigating all kinds of impacts. And it, it won't um, be enough, you know, what we have to do is stop releasing carbon, but we really need to be in a situation where we're building more wetlands rather than losing them. And so I think um, we have to be um, much more um, ambitious when we think about uh, the scale of wetlands. And, and as New Yorkers, we have to be much more comfortable getting used to the idea of water coming and going from our city. Um, too much of our shoreline, we're seeing rising seawalls um, and, and really um, living shorelines in name only. And so we're really eager to demonstrate um, a, a, a shoreline that, that's mostly living with a, a very um, carefully designed engineering component that just tweaks the natural processes enough that our marshes can continue to grow. With that, I'll, I'll open it up and hopefully there will be a few more questions or, or, or uh, uh, if Judith has anything to add about um, what she thinks of our project. I'm particularly interested in her thoughts about how we could, uh, we could encourage as much biodiversity on a site like this as possible. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was suggest I don't know if you've talked to the people at uh, New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, who have been put it put out oyster castles and so forth to restore uh, a uh, a wetland in Raritan Bay, and uh, your 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 system is obviously much lower salinity. Than theirs, but I think uh, you could get some. I can give you offline. I can I can give you some names of people to talk to involved in that project. Sure. Yeah. It, it's um. That would be great. As it, it, there's a lot of examples of similar projects, but we haven't found many in the region. You know, it, it seems like a, a much more tested technology um, further south. Were there any questions, Lauren? That uh, do we get any additional questions from the? Yeah, audience? we've got four questions here, and I think actually there's a statement um, from Pat, no last name, about New York, New Jersey Baykeeper. Um, Pat says New York, New Jersey Baykeeper had to locate oyster castles at I'm not sure where this is NWS Earl because the environmental authorities demanded the oyster. What's that? Naval Weapons Station. Yeah, it's it's. They originally tried to have them located elsewhere, and then uh, some years ago, New Jersey DEP uh, told them they couldn't do that, and so they moved it because they were afraid there would be poaching of the oysters, and they might be getting, you know, uh, contaminated oysters into seafood markets. Yeah. Uh, and so this way. Uh, the site is patrolled by naval officers with guns, so no poachers are going to go there. Mm, yeah, Pat also wrote in to say, similarly, it was for food, food safety 
um, was, was what was being said uh, from yeah. why. And um, we actually don't anticipate a lot of oysters on our reef. Um, it's being installed in the intertidal zone, which is not ideal for oysters. Um, but, you know, it's an example, I think, of, of how we need to change our sense of, of, of what's risky and what's safe. And, and really, I, I, I think we just need to err on the side of education and letting people know how to safely interact with their environment as it's changing rather than not reintroduce living systems into an urban area because we're because of any risk that might be associated. Um, and that, you know, is broadly, I think, you know, how I, my perspective about introducing oysters back into waters that might be polluted. But um, I know it's not a, there are certainly you know, people do love to fish and harvest in the city. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, a question here um, is, how big is the buffer from the oyster castle to the salt scrub transect? What kind of slope does it require? I wish our, our, our um, designer was online with me. Philomena, um, are you here? Yeah. Philomena, type in. She could give us the right numbers. But it, it's a pretty, um, it, it's not um, a huge distance. I would say it varies um, from spot to spot. Uh, there, between the, the salt scrub and the, the reef, um, it's not a uniform distance. Um, and in fact, we modified our design to, to shrink it a little bit um, to accommodate some feedback we got because the project was really designed to manage shoreline erosion it's not creating a dramatic extent of what, as large an extent of wetlands as we had originally thought. Um, but I would say it's on average about 50, 60 feet. Um, and, and I can always follow up with a, a more precise number. Was there another part to that question? It doesn't look like it. Um, if there is another part, yeah, let me go back to who asked that question. Um, Victoria, if, if oh, there's it's about the slope. Oh, um, yeah. What kind of slope does it require? Yeah. And so, you know, I think if you have a gradual slope, you have a potential for greater marsh extent. And in this case, it's um, we have a, a, a significant mud flat and then a fairly steep shoreline, um, which is where our high marsh and, and our salt scrub would be. And so, so finding room for those zones that, that Dr. Weiss was talking about is a little tricky when you're dealing with a human altered shoreline. And so we're regrading the um, high marsh and salt scrub section a bit and, and adding some sand fill. But the majority of, of what we're, we're doing, it, we're not adding any fill to the low marsh, um, which is already a very gradual slope. And, and we expect the sedimentation will establish its own slope. And so we don't have to be as, we don't have to engineer it um, precisely because we're um, expecting the, the river and the oyster castles to establish the appropriate slope on their own. All right. Um, next question is, what are the best ways to monitor shoreline degradation or changes? I can answer while, while uh, Dr. Weiss has a much broader experience than I do, but, but I, I can say that I think it's really hard to do it in a way that's useful and informs policy and informs decision making in a timely manner. Um, and, you know, there, the New York City Parks Department ha has, a, has a great guiding document, as does New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. But, um, our thinking, I think, is on monitoring and, and evaluating these projects it is based on doing a project and walking away and seeing how it does. And it's very difficult to think about um, creating room for failure and creating room for experimentation and creating room for adaptive responses, which, you know, when we're working in, in an urban ecosystem in the face of rapid environmental change, uh, we need to have a really rapid feedback between monitoring and design and management. And that process doesn't necessarily loan itself well to the bureaucratic 
systems that are in place to make sure wetlands are taken care of and make sure good processes are, ta are, are taking place in, in, in decision making about managing public lands. So I think that's it's a huge challenge. I, I don't know, uh, uh, Dr. Weiss, if you have anything to add to what makes a good monitoring program. I, I don't have anything to add. I think you've said it spot on. All right. The, we'll the go good on thing for me <laughs> as someone who takes care of the landscape is um, the need for monitoring is wonderfully empowering because we look at the people who care for our public spaces often it, it, it's not, um, we don't think, look to them to be our brains and we don't look to them to tell the designers what to do. And I think a really, um, a really um, effective monitoring and management regime has the folks who are out taking care of the landscape in a novel changing environment, um, really giving feedback to decision makers and, and, and really empowering the landscapers and the groundskeepers and the and the project managers to be um, thinking about what to do and adapting what we do. And so, in a way, it's a great the the kind of challenges uh, of managing the landscape in in this kind of fast paced scenario. It, it, in a way, it offers a lot of opportunity for people who work with the land. Um, okay, next question here, and I hope I phrase this accurately. Um, is public taken out for human powered boating anticipated at Sherman and Swindlers? So is, is the public, is there going to be access there? If so, would that be informal beach or more built up dock? So there's a, there is um, a few different answers. Um, the site where this Living Shoreline project is happening um, has a small sandy beach, which kayakers have used, and our education programs actually use it uh, to get kids out into the water, and that's going to remain. You know, it may shift a little bit, but so that small informal boat launch, we expect to stay. Um, and then the there is definitely a long-term goal in having uh, a, a larger boat access, and I think um, the only plan in that direction at the moment is the um, Row New York Boathouse, which I think will add a great deal of capacity. And that's a, a, a structure that's planned for another section of the park that will accommodate um, boating and boat launches. But um, I think, yes, I, I think part of a living shoreline has to be um, welcoming the public in as much as possible. So um, I, I, I think, um, any any good development of Sherman Creek Park will definitely in, include increasing the, the capacity uh, for boating on site. Yeah, um, the, the same person who asked that question um, has also um, inserted a, a, a follow-up statement. Um, it says, note, uh, note, I see your kayaker in the display. Also refer to Row New York plans for the inland area. Yes. Um, I think we, we, is there anything we should add to that issue? I, I think we're- I think we're, you, I think you covered it. I just wanted to acknowledge um, the, the other comment that they gave. So we'll go on to the, the question that followed that one, which is um, potential sewer lines flooding you mentioned for the Dykeman houses. Please, please explain this a bit more. Is the marsh oh, well, water- Sorry, sorry. So I, 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 sh I don't mean to suggest that there's an imminent threat uh, uh, of flooding um, I should be careful what I say on, on, the, on the web, but I, I um, broadly, um, may, let me go back in my presentation if I can. Um, broadly, you can see um, all of New York City is going to experience some major flooding. And this map is from the New York City portal, which allows you to look at your own neighborhood and see what the tidal zone is expected to look like and what the 100 year or 500 year floodplain is gonna look like at various time points. And this is all based on, I think, uh, data from the New York City panel on climate change in 2015. I don't think sea level rise projections have changed a lot um, from that time, 
So I think it, it's, it's as good as we still have, um, I think. And so you can see this is the Dykeman houses, and this is the 100-year floodplain. This is the intertidal zone. Um, and, and so what this shows is just that this is the low-lying area, and this is where Sherman Creek used to run. And this is where if you pop the sewer lid off and look in the sewer, you'll see a rushing river a few feet below ground level. And so when we think about, um, this is the projection for 2050, when we think about the future, we have to think seriously about accommodating this kind of change. And we, hopefully we can do it in such a way that um, includes building new wetlands rather than just raising seawalls, which is um, you know, what we have to really, really tackle. And, and that's where my sense of, of urgency and, and my emphasis that this is really a collective political challenge because it's gonna require some real imagination and some real um, acts of faith to um, start to live with this water and if we wanna preserve any ecological function to our shoreline. And, and really it creates an opportunity to make a lot more ecological function than we have um, if we can greet it the right way. Got it. And I, I, yeah, there was a second part to that, but you also addressed it, I think, in your answer. So we can, I think we can move on. Um, there are, just so everyone knows, we have three more questions left. Um, so if you have anything you want to ask, feel free to put it in the queue. We'll make it through these three and then I think we can wrap up. But if you have any other things you would like to add, um, go, go ahead and, and do it now. Um, so the next question is, are there any models that have been made of a, New York, of a New York City in which water can come and go? I think there's a lot of great designs out there and a lot of ideas of what should happen. And, and, and um, Dr. Weiss might know more, but what I, I think happens as these projects start to get realized is, is that element often doesn't make it. I know Brooklyn Bridge Park has a really cool topography that it was really re, re the topography was radically changed to allow water to come and go. And I think that was actually done before Hurricane Sandy and, and fared well in the hurricane, my understanding. But um, I don't, and, and there's, I'm sure there's folks out there who know much, who have a better sense of, of the, the citywide planning on this. But um, I don't think there's a comprehensive model uh, uh, looking at that. And, and one thing to keep in mind is New York City is currently taking public input uh, for a citywide um, shoreline master plan. And so if anyone is interested in these issues and wants to engage with the city, it's a really great time. There's a lot of opportunity to go to a, a meeting or a workshop and, and communicate to the city planning um, agencies what, what we'd like to see. Can we, when we send the, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just add, there, there were meetings around the different boroughs before the pandemic came upon us. Uh, the Waterfront Management Advisory Board and, and Michael Morella of the city planning, who is the waterfront director for the New York City planning, were having meetings all over the city about getting input uh, I think there's still going to be remote uh, types of, of discussions, but it's not the same as being able to have a whole bunch of people in a room talking with each other. Uh, but um, the, per the, the point person for, for the city planning uh, is, is Michael Morella. Um, Jason is, or, or maybe Judy, you know this too. Do you maybe there's a link when we send out the um, recording of this video that we can share that if people want to get involved with those, we can pass along. Um, does something like that exist? Yeah. For okay. Sure. All right. So we can send that along too. Um, let me see what we have here. This is more of a statement. I think it was following up to something we were talking about with New Jersey oysters, but I think we addressed that. Um, okay, so uh, Jason, this is a question for you. Curious what you would recommend for restoring the salt marsh in Inwood Hill Park, question mark. Um, well, before I say anything, I should say that there's a lot of great 
wetland scientists who work for the parks department and know Inwood Hill Park well. So I think um, I would have to defer to their experience, but I, I do think, you know, you could probably tell from some of my comments, I really favor active intervention in, in, in expanding our wetlands and modifying our shoreline. And I think Inwood Hill Park is a great opportunity. Um, you know, the Natural Resources Group has a small passive wetland where they've allowed flood water to go over a path and start to create some high marsh and some salt scrub. And I, I think we should, I'd love to see that whole path come out and that whole shoreline start to be modified. Um, and it could be done in a way that's compatible with public access. You know, we, we don't have to, we have to think about allowing the waters to come and go and doing innovative designs to maintain public access to places that people love to engage with. Um, and I think the large mud flats in Inwood Hill Park are also an interesting challenge. You know, for there ought to be low marsh there. And I, I think um, it's a really good question why there isn't. I think part of it has to do with the um, fine sediments that don't fully drain between tides. And so I think what you would need to do for a more expansive wetland restoration there would be to bring in some sand fill um, to, and, and hopefully you could kickstart a more expansive natural marsh system there that, that would be self-sustaining. Um, I'd love to hear um, if there's, uh, uh, I'm sure some parks department scientists could, could really, I'm sure that, that some of those scenarios have already been thought about. Um, but I think um, there's room in a lot of our parks to do this work, I'll say. Got it. Um, well, that was the last question. So um, we, I, I just want to remind everyone that uh, we're still happy to take any questions you have, right, Jason? If, if folks have stuff they, they want to share, if you can email me, uh, Lauren, my email is on the event uh, web page on the NYR, NYRP website. Um, just to, as follow up, um, if you're signed up for the, um, our newsletter, um, you'll be receiving the recording of this video. We'll send out um, Dr. Weiss's slides and then we'll also, Jason will provide that, that link. So if folks wanna get involved with discussions about New York City shoreline, that'll have uh, more info for you to do so hopefully. So um, we'll follow up with all of that. If you have any concerns um, about receiving any of this information, again, reach out to me via the page on the site. But otherwise, um, Judy and Jason and everyone who watched, thank you so much for your time. Um, oh, we've got two more questions coming in here. One, can we do it? Can we do it? Um, I can hang on the line for, for a while. It, 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 um. Um, this, okay, how do members of the public get involved? Um, Emily, we will send out that link on the, uh, on, in our newsletter. If you have any issues, please go to the webpage and, and I'll sign you up for the newsletter. Um, and I, th I think this one is, do you have any opinion on the North Cove area? Um, so Dr. Weiss, the North Cove is a small kind of you, uh, somewhat degraded mud flat um, that's been stewarded informally by, by uh, one of our, our colleagues and, and, and neighborhood environmentalists. Jim Cataldi, who does wildlife rehabilitation um, and cleaned up a lot of garbage in the area. And there, it, it's one of these small neglected pieces of shoreline that um, I think has a lot of opportunity and just will require some creative balancing of um, how, we, how we provide public access and resources to the public and, and accommodate some ecological restoration. I think the North Cove is, is, is a beautiful little spot that um, has the capacity to, to be improved. Um, in terms of the, the rezoning, um, I think, I mean, there's a lot of questions about housing and how different properties should be developed. Um, and I think that is definitely central to this question in New York City, how we want to build houses, where we want to build houses. And there's not necessarily an easy answer because there's certainly a housing crisis. Um, I guess I would just answer broadly. Um, 
I'd like to see more explicit consideration of climate change and wetland redevelopment when we're thinking about building houses on the waterfront. And, and I don't think that rises um, to the top of the conversation, and I think it should certainly be there. All right, well, on that note, we've answered all the questions. Um, I won't repeat myself again, but I will thank um, both Dr. Weiss and Jason for their time and expertise and for you all for joining. Um, we will be in touch soon via email and um, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.